Hello everyone, welcome back to World of Anatomy. So today we are going to learn all about scapular fracture. So this scapular fracture as a topic will be divided into two parts, two videos separately, part one and part two. Part one consisting the basics like what is scapula, what is the anatomy of scapula, classification of the fractures, your diagnosis, treatment related to medical aspect. And in part two, exclusively, you will be seeing the treatment related to physiotherapy aspect. So let's get started. So coming into our anatomy aspect, I'm just going to name the picture. This is picture number one and this is picture number two. So I'll be talking in context of the pictures. So in picture number one, you can see a blue color shaded bone. Now this bone is called scapula. So scapula uh, is a triangle shape bone. As you can see, it's shape, it's triangle in shape. And it is protected by a lot of muscles. If you see picture number two, this is the outline of scapula, which I'm drawing right here. If you can see how many muscles are attached to scapula, this is the spine of the scapula. How many muscles are attached to scapula? So it has a lot of muscles. So it is a complex system of surrounding muscles. So the scapula is also called as the shoulder blade. And it is the bone that connects the clavicle and the humerus. It is the bone which connects the clavicle and the humerus. So scapula has basically four processes. This is your spine of scapula, your glenoid process, your acromion and your coracoid process. This is the body of the scapula. You have the neck of the scapula also. So there are four processes with body and neck of the scapula. So how does scapula function? What is its main role? Scapula provides the attachment to 18 muscles which connects the thoracic, the spine and the upper extremity. It provides attachment for how many muscles? It provides attachment for 18 muscles which connects the thorax, the spine and your upper extremity. So imagine the function of the scapula. And number two, the main function which it provides is scapulothoracic rhythm. This is what we learn in biomechanics in first year. It's a must must question which also appears in exam scapulothoracic rhythm. So what is this rhythm all about? When we do abduction, our range of abduction is 0 to 180 degree. So abduction is impossible without scapulothoracic rhythm so this is the scapula okay this is the thorax so the scapula attaches to the thorax posteriorly side so when we do abduction the scapula along with the thoracic cavity moves this way it has some amount of range of motion without which the 180 degree abduction is incomplete. So that scapulothoracic movement plays a major role. So this is basically about the anatomy of the scapula. Now let's move on ahead. Now etiology. High energy blunt trauma injuries such as those experienced in a motorcycle or motor vehicle collisions or falling from a significant height can cause a scapular fracture. If you notice can you see here motorcycle, motor vehicle falling from a significant height? These are all high impact, high energy trauma which is caused. Only then the scapula can be fractured. Why? Because it is a very complex system covered by 18 muscles. So you need a high energy or impact or trauma to, you know, actually get a scapular fracture. And when it occurs, it has all associated injuries. 90% of scapular fractures has many associated injuries. So we'll be seeing what are the injuries associated with it. So associated injury. So associated injury, you have orthopedic point of view. You have even the medical point of view. Orthopedic point of view, what are the other injuries which you can usually see? About 52% of injuries which you can see is the rib fracture. So it's like scapula is such a 
complex bone which provides attachment to 18 muscles and lot of ligaments surrounding so it is very well protected and when you have to get in there you will definitely be harming the other structures around so that's the reason you see a lot of associated injuries with it so rib fractures ipsilateral clavicular fractures ipsilateral as in the same side clavicular fractures you can even see spine fractures brachial plexus injury so brachial plexus you know how major role does it play so injury to brachial plexus even though it is like five percent of the cases it can happen but injury to brachial plexus can cause a lot of impairments this is the orthopedic associated injuries which you can see now coming to medical associated injury pulmonary injury pneumothorax pulmonary contusion head injury vascular injury so as i said it is very high impact it rarely happens but when it happens it creates an havoc so these are some of the associated injuries which you can see so as we saw previously scapula has a lot of processes coracoid acromial glenoid spine scapular body scapular neck scapulothoracic disassociation so accordingly your fractures have been further classified Fractures occurring in the coracoid process, fracture occurring, occurring in the acromial process, glenoid process, scapular neck, body, scapular thoracic disassociation. So we'll be looking at it one by one. Moving to coracoid fracture. Coracoid fracture is further divided into type 1 and type 2. So type 1, so this is the coracoid process which I was talking about. So, in type 1, the fracture occurs proximal to the coracoclavicular ligament. Attachment of the coracoclavicular ligament, if you can see the black dotted lines, this is the attachment of the coracoclavicular ligament. And in type 1, the fracture occurs proximal. So, in type 1, the fracture occurs proximal to the coracoclavicular ligament. And in type 2, it's, it occurs towards the tip of the coracoid. This is where you can see type 2 fractures of coracoid process and here is type 1 fracture of coracoid. So coracoid fracture is further divided into type 1 and type 2. Now moving on to acromial fracture. Acromial fracture is further divided into type 1, type 2, type 3. Remember type 1 is non-displaced or minimally displaced. Type 2 is displaced but does not compromise the subacromial space. And type 3 is displaced and compromises the subacromial space. I'll tell you what is subacromial space and when do you say it is compromising, when do you say it is not compromising. But just remember type 1 it is non displaced or minimally displaced. Type 2 it is displaced but it does not harm the subacromial space. Type 3, it is displaced and the subacromial space is compromised. So this is type 1, two types you can see in type 1. This is type 2 and this is type 3, okay. So as you can see in type 1, here it is not displaced, but it has like slight amount of fracture, but here it is displaced. Here it is not displaced and here it is minimally displaced. Type 2, it is displaced. The fracture is displaced, but it does not harm or compromise the subacromial space. The subacromial space is maintained. Whereas in type 3, the subacromial space, sub means below. So you have the acromion process. So below the acromion process, the space which is present is called the subacromial space. This space is called subacromial space. So in type 3, we can see the compromisation of the subacromial space. Now moving to glenoid fracture. Glenoid fracture is further divided into a lot of subtypes. So we'll be looking it into one by one. Glenoid fracture, you have type 1A and type 1B. Type 1A is anterior rim fracture. So this is the glenoid process. Here, this is the anterior rim fracture as you can clearly see it. Type 1B is the posterior rim. Type 1, it was somewhere here. Type 1B is posterior 
it is posterior rim fracture type 2 is fracture line through glenoid fossa exist, exiting scapula laterally okay so this is the fracture which is seen it is exiting scapula laterally okay it is fracture line the fracture line is only present through the glenoid fossa and exiting laterally here the scapula the fracture line is exiting scapula superiorly can you see that it is exiting scapula superiorly here it was in the first type 2 it was exiting laterally it was coming this side it was exiting laterally here it is ex exiting superiorly the fracture fragment or the displaced fracture fragment type 4 fracture line through the glenoid fossa exiting scapula medially exactly medial side the fracture is getting displaced so type 2 was laterally type 3 was superiorly and type 4 is medially okay and type 1a was anterior rim type 1b was posterior rim now type 5a is combination of type 2 and type 4 that is type 4 as we can see scapula exiting medially and type 2 was scapula exiting laterally now type 5b is combination of number 3 that is scapula exiting superiorly and type 4 which is scapula exiting medially so type 1 type 5a is combination of laterally plus medially okay type 2 i mean type 5b is combination of superiorly and medially and type 5c is combination of all the three type 2 type 3 and type 4 that is your laterally superiorly and medially we'll see the pictures ahead see this is variance this is type 5a 5b and 5c as you can see here all you can see superiorly medially laterally this is superiorly this is laterally this is medially type 5b is again combination these are all variants which you can see in the glenoid fractures so that was about the classification part i hope it was clear i know it's a little hard to understand at one go but it is easier when we you know revise stuffs again and again now coming to the symptoms how does a patient present he'll definitely be in extreme pain when you move the arm or even stable if the person comes pain 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 number two swelling around the back of the shoulder there's a huge amount of swelling seen because there's so much of destruction can you see that like 18 muscles and then getting into the fracture so definitely there's a huge amount of swelling and uh, scrapes around the affected area scrapes as in you can see um, capillary burst over the skin so that is called as scrapes which can see which we can visualize around the area now coming to investigation part investigation simple x-ray is fine to see fracture of the bone anterior posterior lateral axillary view it is done but when we say the soft tissue injury is involved it is always better to get a ct scan or an mri done because we see a lot of associated injuries so a ct scan or an mri is definitely recommended because we may misdiagnose the case of something else and or we may just tend to avoid the medical condition like pulmonary condition which can lead to death so we know what all that complications so it is always and always advisable to get ct scan and mri done if a person is having scapular fracture now coming to the treatment part you have non-operative treatment and you have operative treatment so what do you do with the non-operative treatment we usually put sling for about two weeks followed by early motion now why do we do early motion to avoid 
further complications like frozen shoulder. So little amount of early motion pendulum exercises, which I'll be talking about in the physiotherapy part, is definitely, definitely advisable. Now, what are the indications when you say, okay, this person can be treated non-operatively or this person can be treated operatively. So for non-operatively, majority of the scapular fractures, like about 90% of scapular fractures are minimally displaced. I said it is really hard to, you know, get inside and get the scapular fracture and all. But when it happens, it is almost minimally displaced. So 90% of the scapular fracture is minimally displaced. So it is always indicated for non-surgical type of treatment. So what are the outcome? After about six weeks, the union occurs and usually if there's no injury to the soft tissues, you may not see any abnormality. Like there might be brachial plexus injury in severe cases where you can see an abnormality. But since the fracture fragments are very minimally displaced, so you actually do not have any kind of further complications. But early motion is definitely required. So 90% of the scapular fractures is treated conservatively or non-operatively. Now, coming to the operative treatment, as we saw only about in about 10% of cases, you will need an operative approach. And it is usually open reduction internal fixation type of approach which is done. So what are the indications? When do you say that this person has to go under operative treatment and we cannot treat the patient conservatively? Number one, floating shoulder. In case of floating shoulder, open fracture, lateral column displacement, glenohumeral instability, displaced scapular neck fracture. As I told you, there's neck fracture of the scapula as well. So if the displacement is more than 40 degrees, then you will definitely need to undergo surgery. Coracoid fracture with more than one centimeter displacement. We saw two types of coracoid fracture. So in either of the cases, if you can see more than one centimeter of displacement, you will need surgical approach and loss of rotator cuff functions. So if you can all see in all these indications, it's very highly traumatized. Like your fractures either open, lot of destruction inside, your vessels, your muscles are cut down, your vessels, brachial plex injuries. So there are a lot of associated injuries. That's when we get into your operative kind of treatment. In all these cases, you can see a lot of associated injuries. So surgery is done very rare, but we always do it when there is a lot of complications. So in order to, you know, sum it all, fra scapular fracture is very rarely seen because of its complex covering up by the muscles, the ligaments, and you know, it's a very strongly protected bone but when it the fracture occurs it's 90 percent associated with other injuries orthopedic injuries or medical interventions medical injuries can be seen and 90 percent of the time it can conservatively be treated because there's hardly minimal displacement until and unless it is high trauma fracture kind of state and in about 10 percent of cases where it is an open fracture, floating shoulder, there's instability, that's when you go for operative kind of treatment. So here we complete our first part of scapular fracture. In second part, I'll be showing you pictures related to the first part as well and also the physiotherapy management exclusively. So hope this video was helpful to you. Um, and this is only for educational purposes and if you have any suggestions or any questions please do let us know in the comments below we will definitely approach in the next video regarding that thank you